God's holy word. Um, really thankful for it. Really thankful for um, this portion of scripture. And if you will, uh, turn, uh, take out your the table's outline, if you will. Take out that table's outline. I think I want to start opening up with that because it's going to help us see a few uh, critical things that we need to see. Um, it's going to help us see a few critical things that we need to see. Now, what, what we should know is that in Genesis chapter 6, verse 18, God actually says, I will establish, but with you, I will establish my covenant. He talks to Noah about how he's going to establish a covenant with him. But then he says here in Genesis chapter 9, I'm going to establish a covenant with you and with your seed after you and with the fowls of the air and with um, the cattle and with the creeping things and with all flesh that moves upon the earth. What you see is um, a distinction in two covenants. A distinction in two covenants. One covenant that God makes with Noah in Genesis chapter 8 is a covenant that is of grace. It is of grace. But it's a covenant to protect exclusively Noah and his family and some select um, animals from the animal kingdom to protect them from the wrath of God to protect them from the wrath of God, to preserve their life as God pours out the, 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 the fury of his watery wrath upon the world universally. This is what we see about that particular covenant. That covenant was not a universal covenant. It wasn't made for to everyone. It wasn't established with everyone. You see that there. Mm -hmm. It was only established with Noah and his family and all of the, uh, the select animals. But in this particular covenant here in Genesis chapter 9 is not only with Noah, but with the world. And so we want to look at the, um, the covenant of Genesis 6 and Genesis 9. We want to compare the two. And you have your, 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 uh, you have your, um, your table, table 5.1. And I got this table um, from uh, a book. It's called Covenant Theology, Biblical Theology. Um, I'm sorry, Covenant Theology. And it's biblical, theological, and historical perspectives. And the author of this particular section is, um, is uh, Dr. Miles Van Pelt. He's one of my professors at uh, Reformed Theological Seminary. And, and, and it's a really good um, grid for you to look at. Um, it, 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 it kind of sheds light on, on, on the distinction of, 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 the, of those covenants, those two covenants, and brings a little bit more clarity to us. So look at here um, in table 5.1, covenants in uh, Genesis 6 and 9 compared. You see here where it says uh, that God established uh, a covenant with Noah in Genesis 6, 18. You can probably write that in there. Um, but then in, in Genesis 9, uh, he establishes with all humanity, uh, the, the animal kingdom and the earth. And you can write down Genesis chapter 9, verse 8 through 11 in that particular box there. So you see the distinction. That's what we talked about. The second, the second uh, category is this covenant is a covenant of salvation from the judgment of God. It's, it's, a, it's a covenant of salvation from the judgment of the flood. And then in Genesis chapter 9, it is a covenant of preservation until final judgment. So it's a covenant of preservation of life universally until the final judgment, as long as the earth remains. This is this covenant comes to play um, of, of, of what, what he promises that he will not do to all flesh as he has done in this previous covenant. And then the, the third tier, we have a covenant made with Noah because of his righteousness. I like that. Mark that. And you see that in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. I'm going to go back to that as we move into our, um, our set of verses here. But this covenant uh, is a covenant made with humanity in spite of their wickedness. Look at Genesis 8, 21. It says, and the Lord smelled the sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. 
for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing, everything living as I have done. So you see the, the, the distinction, the, the, the contrast here. Mm -hmm. And then the last category, you yeah. see, it says that a covenant, this covenant required Noah's obedience in building and provisioning of the ark. If Noah did not actually obey God in building the ark, would he have been saved? No, <laughs> it required that, right? Yeah. It required him to do everything that God committed him to do. And then what we have here in this covenant, it's a covenant without any requirement to experience the blessing. And here he puts common grace of common grace. I wouldn't use that term right. um, because there's nothing common about grace to me. Um, honestly, the first time the word grace is used is actually in Genesis chapter six and if you look at genesis chapter six this is not used in a common way i want to look here at verse um i want to look here at verse uh seven look at verse seven in genesis chapter six and the lord said i will destroy man whom i have created from the face of the earth both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowl of the air for it repented me that I have made it. Why? Well, you look at verse five, he saw that all the wickedness of man was great and how every imagination of the thought of the intent of the heart was only evil continually. Mm -hmm. So this was God's assessment and his diagnosis of the world universally. But look at verse, and by the way, it's still God's diagnosis. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. It hasn't changed. Yeah. Right. It hasn't changed. But the reason why we're not consumed is because of this second covenant that he has made. All right. OK. <laughs> OK. This is this is amazing. It's, it's a covenant. This is of grace. But we're going to learn this. But look at here. Look at here in verse eight. It says, but this is a con contrasting conjunction here. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, you see the term grace, it's used here for the first time. It doesn't mean that God has, he has been gracious for the first time. I want you to know that. Just because the term is used for the first time, it doesn't mean that he has, at this moment, started being gracious for the first time. Actually, after Adam sinned, he should have died immediately. Right. But he, he, he actually prolonged that judgment. And what is that called? It's called, it's called mercy. <laughs> it's called mercy. And then when he clothed him with the, with the skins of an animal, that's what we call grace. That's what we call grace. All right. So let's think about this. Hey, Judah. Um, let, let's think about this. The first time that grace is used technically um, and grammatically in Hebrews, or not Hebrews, Genesis chapter six. Now, Malachi, you should be talking. Okay. All right. Um, in, in Genesis chapter six, verse eight, verse eight, um, it says, but Noah found grace in his eyes. I want you to know that that this grace is used discriminately. This term grace is used to discriminate. It's used to uh, differentiate. It's used um, to, to pick out somebody among a whole host of people. It's what we call election. Okay, this 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 grace that 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 Noah finds in the eyes of the Lord is a sovereign grace. It is a particular grace. It is not a common thing that everybody else got. The rest of the world did not find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Only Noah and his family found that grace. And so just know that that's why I wouldn't necessarily use that, that, that particular, um, that particular phraseology. I don't, I don't, you know, it's, it's not a essential thing. So some people might have more wisdom than me, um, with regards to the word common grace, I would say, um, common goodness. How you doing, brother? How you doing? Good see you, man. All right. And here, here's an outline for you, if you like. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, so 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 let let's let, let's get to it. Let's get to it. What I want to point out is this. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No one's using that. All right. She's gonna turn it down. 
<laughs> All right, I hear myself. That's why I got kind of distracted. Since somebody said, "Don't worry, don't worry about it. I'm gonna sit over there." All yeah. right, so so um so in in um in in your outline, I want to deal with these three points regarding the covenant that he makes with. Noah and all of his family, his seed after him, and all the animals, this universal covenant. I want to deal with this. But I want to make one more contrast between this covenant that he, he, he establishes with Noah in Genesis 6 and 7 versus the covenant that he establishes with Noah in Genesis chapter 9. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be good for us to contemplate it. Um, Hey Lex, can you hit number three on that remote right there so we can get this thing going? Mm -hmm. I know, I know there's room temperature coming. Yeah. All right. Um, and matter of fact, if you like Malachi uh, or Judah, open that uh, open that slide door. How you doing, Tim? Open that slide door right there. Yeah, open it, crack it a little bit. Yep. Thank you. All right. So. One, one, one more contrast I want, I want to make here. One more contrast. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come you and all your house into the ark, for you have I seen righteous before me in, his, in this generation. Now, I want you to know something. That... The reason why Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, positionally and objectively, is because there was a righteousness that God found for Noah. There was a righteousness that God found for Noah. And remember, right after you read, he found grace in his, eye, in his eyes. It says that Noah in his generation was just. And we said the just live by what? Faith. 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 So that means that the righteousness that he had was a righteousness that wasn't intrinsically his. It was, it was a foreign righteousness. It was a righteousness outside of him, rooted in another person, and that person is who? Jesus. It's Christ. So there was a righteousness found for him. He was saved because of someone else's righteousness. He was rescued from a judgment because of someone else's righteousness. Okay? This is amazing. This points to the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, the perfect life that he lived in our place and in our stead. Jesus Christ's righteousness is what we see in God clothing Adam and Eve with the skins of an animal. It points to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And, and therefore, even in time, because time is kind of, you know, it's, God is not bound to it. He's not bound to it. He dispenses his grace upon one of his servants as though Christ had already lived at perfect life on his behalf because Christ is the eternal son of God. And he is the eternal substitute for sinners, the eternal representative and mediator for us. He was manifested for our purposes, but he is our righteousness, right? Now that's the case for this particular covenant. This covenant was based upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm making this point. I'm hitting this point for a reason. Because this particular covenant in Genesis chapter 9 is based upon not the righteousness of Christ, but it's based upon the death of Christ. The preservation of life that we experience and enjoy today is based upon a sacrifice, a spotless sacrifice that was made by Noah that moved God's heart to smell it and to savor it and to say, never again will I curse the ground in spite of the wickedness of men. Did, was he, did he take delight in, 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 in the sacrifice of bulls and goats? No. What did he smell? If we want to use that anthropomorphic language, who was he pleased in? He was pleased in Jesus Christ, who was viewed to be as of a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So I want you to see the basis of this covenant is based upon blood. When that blood was spilt, a covenant was cut with the universe. 
This is why we can say that this aspect, this contemplating it in this way makes it of grace, okay? Makes it of grace. So let's look at here in our outline, and, I, and, and this is what I start with, the basis of the covenant of preservation. And that's what I call this particular covenant, a covenant of preservation. It's a ransom. And look at verse 20. This is the first thing that happens when he gets out of the ark. When God calls him out of the ark, <clears throat> he calls him out of the ark. And after he calls him out of the ark, telling him to take him and his family to come out and all the animals and populate the world, the first thing that Noah does is he builds an altar unto the Lord and took every clean, every clean, every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. This is the first thing that he does, the first works that he does when he comes out of the ark. Now, let me, let me ask y'all a question. <clears throat> if you guys were in Noah's situation, And God came to you. It had never rained before. It had, look, it had never fired universally on the earth. It, no water has ever hit the earth at all. And God comes to you and he says he's going to make a covenant with you. And he's going to save you and your family and all the animals. But he's going to destroy the rest of the world. And he gives you instructions by which you are able to build something that amounts to the safety and security of your family to withstand and go through alive the wrath of God and make it out on the other side. When you get out of that ark and you, you look around and nobody is there but you and your family and the animals that were with you in that ark. First of all, don't you think... God was faithful to his promise. Amen. Wasn't he faithful? We made it out. On the other side, just imagine what it's going to be like when you get to glory. Whoa, we made it. What's the first priority? Worship, praising him. That's exactly what he was doing here. He praised him. He offered up a sacrifice of what? Praise. This is what he was doing. This is so, so that someone A, it says the spotless sacrifice to God prioritized in worship. The spotless sacrifice to God prioritized in worship. Now, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, this principle is clear. In, in, in all of scripture, but I'm going to read a few passages. I'm going to go to uh, various passages just so that you can see um, what I'm talking about, how to view this particular text here and interpret it correctly. In, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, after he gets done talking about, he gets done talking about the wrath of God is coming upon all men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Sounds like Noah's day, doesn't it? And he begins to list out all the sins and all the rebellions. And he begins to talk about this none righteous, no, not one. And by the deeds of the law, no flesh is justified in God's sight. But the righteousness of God is revealed from heaven apart from the law and the prophets, but testified by the law of the prophets. And it's by faith in Jesus Christ alone that you are justified in God's sight. And he becomes the just and justifier of all those who simply put their trust in him. He goes through the whole gamut of how, what it means for God to save us. And that those whom he predestined, or those who he foreknew, he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he, 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 he predestinated, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he what? Glorified. Glorified. And he's talking about, and then he goes to talking about election in chapter 9. He goes talking about it's of grace. And that he saves who he wills. He hardened whom he wills. He shows mercy to whomever he shows mercy. And if you're a byproduct of mercy, we worship him, don't we? 
Well, in light of all of what he got done arguing and talking about how a person is saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man shall boast. In verse 1 of Romans chapter 12, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He just got done. He summarized the first 11 chapters as the mercies of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, presenting your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, that's why the animals were clean, that's the principle, and acceptable in, uh, uh, unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, this is, this is what we're called to do in view and in light of God's mercies, all right? And then in Hebrews chapter 13, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10. This is what Hebrews 13 says. In verse 10, it says, <clears throat> we have an altar... Hebrews 13, starting at verse 10. It says, we have an altar, therefore they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. I'm not going to explain that. You just read the context. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood it, it, it is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burnt without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffer it without the gate, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach for we have uh for for the he, here have we no continuing city but we seek one to come by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to god continually that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name this is this is this is the sacrifice of praise that he's giving to the Lord because of his goodness, his faithfulness to his promises. This is what Noah is doing. Noah in principle is doing this. One more passage, 1 Peter chapter two. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter two. And this is a passage that we all know and love, I think, um, hopefully, maybe not. But in 1 Peter chapter two, Verse five, it says, <clears throat> it says, you also <clears throat> as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. This is who we are. And this is what we're called to do as priests. We're called to offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God, which are acceptable. Notice the, the trend. The sacrifice has to be acceptable to God. It's about God accepting your worship. I mean, think about the first time worship took place after the sin, after the fall between Cain or between um uh yeah Cain and uh Abel. Cain and Abel. Who, did, did God accept both of their their their, their sacrifices? No. no. Who sacrificed children that did, did God accept? Abel's. And what did he what did he sacrifice? He sacrificed the lamb. There we go. Well, what about what about Cain? Why didn't he why didn't he um sacrifice why didn't he accept Cain's sacrifice? Because, because he cursed the, he cursed the ground. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not because he cursed the ground. <laughs> All right, that's a good answer, but that's not why. Anybody, kids? Huh? Yeah. Because he had fruit. Which are like. And it wasn't pleasing to God. Uh, yeah, but I'm asking why. I'm asking why it wasn't pleasing to God because he, there, there's fruit offerings in the, the the New Testament or in the Old Testament. It wasn't pure. It wasn't pure. That's true. That's true. That is true. And I'll say this. I'll add to that. That That's Naomi. Go ahead. Um, 
No. Say it loud. Because he made it out of, out of, out of, out of. Never mind. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's all right. I, 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 I'll repeat what Naomi said. Naomi said that it was by, he brought to, to God his own works, his own labors from his own hand. And, and, and God does not accept our own works. He does not accept our own works, the labor of our hands to be acceptable in his sight. He, he recognizes sacrifice because when you think about a sacrifice, a sacrifice in your place means that you recognize that you are a sinner, number one. Number two, you recognize that you deserve to die. And number three, you recognize your need of a substitute. And that God accepts a substitute as long as he is spot, without spot and without blemish. He is righteous and he is holy because it recognizes God's character as being holy. So, so this is the first principle that's being used in scripture and, 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 and we come to discover that that's precisely what, that's precisely what Noah was doing. But let's look at here at the spotless sacrifice to God prioritizing. What I mean by prioritizing children is this, worshiping God is why you were made. So it therefore should be the priority of your life. It should be the very first thing that you're concerned about. It should be the, the, the primary thing that you are, that you live for. In everything that you do, you want to do it unto God's glory, children. You want to do it unto God's glory. You want God to be recognized as glorious. You want to reflect his image in your body at, and, and do that which is pleasing in his sight so that God's face or his glory is seen all throughout the world okay you have to you have to know we were made for his pleasure we were made to reflect his glorious image we we're, were made to reflect his character and his attributes this is why we were made And so we want to prioritize that. Well, let's, let, let's look at here at verse 20. It says in, in, in uh, Genesis chapter 8, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. Now look, what's amazing is after God destroys everything, you still have wood. <laughs> Hallelujah. You still have wood. Thank you, Lord. I mean, you got a lot of wood on that ark. <laughs> right? You got a lot of wood on that ark. There's still wood. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for wood and stones and, and all that. So what he did was he prepared an altar. He prepared an altar. You know we have to prepare for worship. We have to prepare for worship. Yeah. That means that you have to be intentional, Malachi. You have to be intentional, Zandon, about why you're going to church. Mm. Why you're reading the Bible, why you're having family worship. That's right. Why, why you're coming to Bible study. If your primary concern, children, when you come to Bible study is not to learn from the Lord, to learn of the Lord, that you might know him better, you might please him better, and that you might worship him for who he is and what he's done. If that's not your pride primary reason but your primary reason is to see your friends and to have fun and to play video games you miss the mark altogether this is about this is about and uh, us adults you guys can make the application too because there's so many benefits in the church there's so many we we love each other we want to fellowship with each other isn't that right we, we want to see each other's face we want to we want to encourage each other we want to edify each other we want to enjoy each other because we know that we're going to spend with each other all eternity worshiping the the the, the king of glory however that's not our primary concern our primary concern is to worship god that's the primary concern so he prepared an altar and this points to God, having always prepared for the Lord Jesus Christ a, a suffering, an instrument of death, so that he can redeem sinners like you and I from his wrath. Hmm. This points to God before 
the foundation of the world, preparing the only way by which we're delivered from his wrath. And you're about to see him, in, in, him, him reaffirming and reestablishing capital punishment, and you're going to see Christ all in that. You're just going to see Christ all in that. He's intentional, but this is not accidental. He has already carved it out in eternity past, and he's setting forth his decree. It points to the suffering of Christ on the cross. It's, it, it points to Jesus becoming a curse for us. Hmm. Because he is worshiping God for reversing the curse. He's on Mount Ararat. Yes, he's, he's thanking God for providing for Noah a ransom. That's what the pitch is all about. The price of a life. God provided that for him, and he's worshiping him for that. Okay. But not only did Noah prepare an altar, but he picked specific animals. Again, Noah, I want you to view Noah, I want you to view Noah as pointing to God the Father in every point that we talk about regarding him preparing and picking animals and offering a sacrifice. Look at God the Father's work. God doesn't choose any sacrifice, all right? He doesn't choose any savior to save sinners. He's holy. He chose one, and what's his name? Jesus. It's Isaiah 42. You can see that Jesus is called as the servant of the Lord, his elect, in whom his soul is, de is delighted in. He picks clean animals. It points to the spotlessness and the holiness of Jesus Christ. It points to his perfect righteousness because, you know, when God, and, and we learned this, God only accepts a perfect sacrifice. A perfect sacrifice. You can find this in Hebrews 9, 14. Don't have time to go there. And then he presents this sacrifice to God by fire. By fire. This sacrifice is being consumed. Is being consumed. Think about this. And when God smells it, don't you get the indication that he's pleased with it? Well, the sacrifice points to the sufficiency of the death of Christ to rescue us from the wrath of God and to grant our acceptance before God. That sacrifice points to the sufficiency of Jesus to save by his death alone. When he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost, there was no more work left to be done. Amen. All sins have been punished for all of his elect, and all sins have been put away, and all of God's wrath have been absorbed and have been removed. The curse for his elect at the death of Christ was legitimately reversed. But God, the Father, is the one that gets the glory because it was him that did not spare his son but delivered him up for us all. It was God's pleasure to bruise him. He caused his soul to grieve. I'm quoting Romans chapter 8. I'm quoting Isaiah 53. Think about it. It was by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God that it was through the hands of wicked men that Jesus Christ was crucified and slain. It was on purpose. God purposed this. He planned this. And in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, it says that he was delivered for our offenses. And he was raised for our justification. The Father delivered him up for our offenses. The father is to be viewed through Noah, and the father is to be viewed as a priest, as a priest. 
because what we're looking at is a picture that God is pleased with. Isn't God pleased with himself? Yes. God is pleased with his own purposes being modeled and manifested in types and shadows because he purposed it. And he's performing it through his people. This is amazing. This is amazing. This is how we're to view this here. Look at sub point B in your outline. Sub point B. I have so many other passages to go to, but let's look at it. I want you to look at the satisfying smell to God, to God published. And it has to do with his will, of his will. Now, the word that I use here in sub point B um, that, that, that I want you to think about is the word for propitiation, the word propitiation, because that's the idea. Uh, it's a long word, I know, but this word, it literally means for God's wrath to be satisfied. It means for his wrath to be pacified, to be quenched, to, to, for his wrath to be put away. When, when, when we think about um, <laughs> when we think about when we think about the sacrifice, when we think about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and I'm gonna just say this and move on. The sacrifice first and foremost is not about you and me. So this aspect of the gospel should humble us. When we think about the sacrifice, it's not first and foremost about you and me. It's about God's issue with us. His issue with us is that he is holy and he loves righteousness. And because he made creatures in his image that they should be holy as he is holy, completely and totally devoted to him. But they fail in Adam and they have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And they're devoted to themselves. They're devoted to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And God hates sin. And God punishes sins. He judges it and he executes us for it. And God's wrath is kindled. He is, he is angry with the wicked every single day. The Bible puts, makes it very clear. God hates all workers of iniquity. He doesn't just hate the iniquity. He hates the workers of iniquity. And he's angry with the wicked every day. This is Psalm 711 and Psalm 117. Just so that you're clear on, on, on God's stance in his holiness. So when he provides himself a sacrifice without spot, wrinkle, or any such blemish, he is dealing with his own problem with us. When he provides himself a sacrifice, he's dealing with his problem with us because you can't deal with his problem with us. We can't deal with his problem with us. We can't solve our own problem. We can't solve God's problem, <laughs> okay? But God can both, he can both solve his problem and our problem in one fell swoop. And his name is who? Jesus. So, so, so this is something we should think about. And God satisfies his own wrath. This is what's pictured by Noah in him offering. This. Now, I'm going to tell you like this. If God was satisfied, if God literally smelled the animal as they were executed, he wouldn't smell something sweet, okay? So we don't get caught up in literal stuff. He won't, you won't smell, how many of y'all like smelling blood? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I smell blood. Yeah, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't ask if you smell blood. I asked, do you like smelling blood? And not only that, it, it's not just blood. But it's a body on fire. Have you ever smelled a body on fire? No, I don't want to either. <laughs> but it don't smell good. I can assure you that. 
Yeah, okay, yeah. Does it, does it smell good? Yeah. No. It's wretched. Yeah. Awful. Awful. So if we if we take this literal, we're we're perplexed. So why would God like smelling a burning sacrifice? No, he is pleased with what it symbolizes and points to his eternal purposes in Jesus Christ. He is always and only pleased with Christ. And he is the one that sat that turns God's anger, his wrath, into a huge smile for all of his elect. Yeah. Now, also what I want you to do, uh, what, what I want you to think about is this, that when God said, when God it says, that, and the Lord smelled the sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. I mean, this right here, he is making a promise based upon a sacrifice. And I want to say this. This is what Romans 8, 1 says. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In John chapter 3, verse 18, Jesus says, he that believes on me is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the only name of the only begotten Son of God. God makes a promise based upon a death. Just like he makes a promise based upon the death of Jesus Christ. What God actually said when Jesus gave up the ghost, never again. Never, I will never punish my people's sins for, I will never punish them for their sins. I will never touch them. I will never send them one day, one second, one millisecond into the flames of my fury because my justice has been satisfied. I will never deal with my people according to their sins. No matter how, even in spite of their wickedness, right? This is this is a this is a this points to a greater reality. This is why it's a grace, okay? A greater reality, but it's it's still a type, right? It's still a type. We want to want to make sure that we keep it there at a type. The fact that judgment did not remove sin. So I want you to see this. This is why you know it's a type. Because after he saves Noah and his family and the animals and bring them out to the other side, wickedness is still there. <laughs> Sin is still there. Right? Corruption is still there. The seed of the serpent is still there. But not with Christ. Not in his death. And in his resurrection, and in his ascension, and in him preparing a place, and him coming back to get his people, and in the new heaven and new earth, every everything is going to be new, everything is going to be fresh, nothing is going to be dead or corrupt or decayed, everything is going to be white and perfect and, and, and compatible to the holiness of God, and everyone in it. Death is going to be cast into the lake of fire. Sin is going to be cast. All the cowards and fornicators and adulterers and whoremongers and all of those who are homosexual and effeminate and all of the transgenders and every person that chooses to pervert their lives will be cast into the lake of fire and he will utterly eradicate all sin by that one man, Jesus Christ, who he has raised from the dead never to die anymore and lives to God's glory at his right hand, ruling and reigning over the entire universe where the earth is his footstool and heaven is his throne. I don't know. See, I don't understand people when they hear the gospel, how you don't get excited. I don't understand that. 
I don't understand it. But, you know, we have our different expressions. We have our different right. expressions, right? We have our different expressions. I get that. I can see it in, I can see it in Sarah's face that she's excited, but she ain't jumping and hooping and hollering like I am. <laughs> <laughs> right? She's just like, ah, oh, she's just letting it sink in. Right. So I love it. Let's do point number two, and then we're going we gonna to have to shut it down. I, man, I don't even know how much time I started. I started at 56. All right, so let's look at point number two. Hey, you got one more hour. Okay, all right. So point number two. So after we look at, after we look at, the uh, basis of the covenant of preservation. I want you to know, and I want to just mark this, that this particular covenant in, in, in Genesis chapter 9 is based upon the death. Remember, the covenant in Genesis 6 is based upon the righteousness of Christ. This here is based upon the death of Christ. And I want you to, I want to combine the two together and say, God never makes a covenant of grace apart from the righteousness and blood of Jesus Christ. He never, ever does. Every covenant flows from a greater covenant called the covenant of redemption that has been established between him and Jesus Christ and the spirit of God. Even the temporal covenants. Because this particular covenant will end. And then again, it won't. Because even in the new heavens and new earth, no water is going to ever hit it like it did in Noah's day. No wrath at all. So when you hear the idea of an everlasting covenant in relationship to this particular covenant, it transcends time and space. Eternal transcends time and space. And we have to think about eternal things because we know that this old order will come to pass. It will be done away with. The second point you want to consider is the blessings of the covenant of preservation, a renewal. My brother Tim over there getting excited too, but he's standing like he is so delighted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> security. <laughs> the blessings of the covenant of preservation or renewal. All right, so we're going to do the first seven verses. And um, in your chart, pull that chart back up. Pull the chart back up. Um, I want to point out a few things here. <clears throat> and, and we're going to go slowly. I want you to see this because this chart does it. Um, and, and I want you to see it's what we would call a recapitulation principle. A recapitulation principle. What, what's happening is a renewal, a reestablishment of things. Um, that had been established in the first order, okay? Um, and I want you to know that this preservation, this preservation of life, this preservation of life, children, children, this preservation of life has in its mind, that's all good. We've got so many distractions going on. It's all good because it's good. That's why it's good. So let's continue. Let, let the distractions come. But here's the point. The, the, the covenant of preservation of life is how you need to, to, to view this particular covenant and, the, and, 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 and understand that he has the life of his people in view, but he definitely and most assuredly has the life of Jesus Christ in view, of him actually entering into the world. The stay of judgment and the preservation of life is so that God can, in the economy of redemptive history, manifest forth his eternal purposes all the way to the coming of our covenant surety, Jesus Christ, who fulfills all things. You got to understand, this is what God has in view. And God has always intended for his son to put on humanity, to be a a representative of a new humanity, as he is called the last Adam. Okay. Now, what I want you to what I want you to know, I want you to remember these things because we talked about this, and you're going to hear me say this throughout our course 
when we deal with covenant theology, when we deal with the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the new covenant, when we deal with those covenants and, and, and manifest the distinctions in, in, in the continuity, the, the similarities of them, I want you to keep in mind what is entailed in a covenant. I define what a covenant is. A, a covenant is, is, is a bond in blood sovereignly administered. That's a divine covenant, a bond in blood sovereignly administered. You'll never see God enter into a covenant where he asks someone, do you agree with me? It's not a mutual agreement in this kind of a covenant. He makes the covenant sovereignly. He sets the conditions. He doesn't allow for those lesser than him to set those conditions. When it comes to a covenant of grace, he actually makes a promise that is not conditioned upon their character and is not conditioned upon their performance, their conduct, but is solely conditioned upon his faithfulness, not only to make that promise, but to keep his promise and to perform as he had promised. Okay? So when we deal with the contents of a covenant, I want you to know that there are persons in that covenant. There are promises in that covenant. There are blessings in that covenant. There are conditions that are in that covenant. Now, there are always conditions in a covenant. I want to say that. Always, can, even in the covenant of grace, there are conditions that all believers must meet, that all God's elect must meet. But here's the, here's the uh, catch-22. God enables us to meet them. <laughs> okay? He enables us to meet them. We must believe or we'll perish. Now, perishing is not a part of the covenant promise of grace. It is, this is a covenant curse for not actually meeting the conditions of those grace, of this grace. But God enables us to believe. He enables us to walk by faith and not by sight. He enables us to persevere. So I need you to know there's not one covenant you'll find that there's no conditions in them. And not only that, but God also will meet the conditions on our behalf. <laughs> Okay? Hallelujah! Like, we, we, in order to have eternal life, I gotta be righteous. I'm not righteous. Okay? Well, the Lord already saw that. He gave us a substitute. The wages of sin is death. Uh-oh, I deserve to perish under the wrath of God. The Lord saw that too. He met both of those conditions. That's why he can be just and the justifier of those who will put their trust, their faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. All right. So there's persons and parties. There's promises and blessings. There are um, uh, there are uh, conditions that I would like to call prohibitions. And then there's punishments for not meeting those conditions. And then there are proofs of God fulfilling his promise and they're called covenant signs. They're called signs of a covenant. And we're gonna deal, you're gonna see all of these things here, very clear, very vividly. All right, so let's deal with it, let's deal with it. Um, you said I started when? All right, I got six minutes. I'm only gonna deal with uh, point number two and we'll just have to pick up in point number three next week. Um, Brother Ramel told me that he, he told me to take my time. And what he meant was take my time tonight. <laughs> but I'm going to take my time. Um, so look at here, the blessings of the covenant of preservation, a renewal. Now, what? look at verse one. Look at verse one. Verse one says this. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Right. So point A, that's the term for procreation. 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 Be fruitful and multiply and replenish. But it's familiar because it's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Turn there with me. Genesis 1, 28. This is what it says. <clears throat> And God blessed them and said unto them, what? Mm -hmm. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So you see that he is still continuing the 
the, the, the preservation of life by the procreation and repopulation of, of, of image bearers all over the world. Because he's concerned about his elect being saved. He's concerned about his son entering into the world, dealing with the sin problem. Also, uh, point, uh, sub, sub point B, the term is predominance, or you could put preeminence there. Because in, point, in, in uh, Genesis 9, 2, it says, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moves upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hands are they delivered. So you see what God is saying is, I am giving you dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air. When it says the fear and dread of you shall be in them, they actually will bow to them, bow to, to mankind as being preeminent over them, as being preeminent over them. And that's also something that we read. But really, it points to the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? It really does point to the Lord Jesus Christ because, again, he made them subject to mankind. And you know, that, that glorious psalm, that glorious psalm, uh, psalm, I think it's uh, Psalm uh, 8, verse 4 through 8, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that you visited him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. And you placed everything under his feet, the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, and every creeping thing. But in Hebrews chapter 2, this is what it says about who that man is that God is intending for us to think about when we contemplate the preeminence and predominance of man, those who have dominion over the universe. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, in verse uh, 6, it says this. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visited him? You made him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of your hands. <clears throat> you have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all things subject under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But we, but, but now we see not yet all things put under him. But who do we see? In verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he might, that he might, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom all, are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. <clears throat> this is amazing. Let's turn back to our text because this is, again, he's, he's talking about his son. Look at uh, sub point C. Look at the term provision. The term P is for provision of food, provision. Look at verse three or verse four. <clears throat> no, a verse three of uh, Genesis chapter nine. Now, remember the blessings that he's providing, they're meant to be enjoyed by obedience. So when, he, when it says he blessed him and said unto him, them be fruitful and multiply, he was commanding them to be fruitful and multiply. But at the same time, he was blessing them. Well, the blessing is tied to the command because God means for you to enjoy the blessing by obedience to the command. He never intends for anyone to enjoy a blessing apart from obedience. He never intends. Never intends. God, now he's holy. He never intends that. He never intends that. We thank, we thank God for providing Christ in his obedience. On our behalf, but we also thank God for enabling us to obey that faithful gospel that was preached to us by simply believing in the truth. And we are thankful in our sanctification when God grants us the grace to obey, we get to experience the blessing of it. Because on the flip side, when we don't, 
we don't feel blessed at times, right? We don't feel blessed. And we don't get to enjoy the feeling of being blessed. We don't get to enjoy the assurance of being blessed when we live in patterns of life of sin. Now, the provision of food. Here in uh, verse three, is an addition. Every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you. Every, uh, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So he is in Genesis chapter one, he gives him the herbs. In Genesis chapter two, he gives him meat too. Amazing. It's a blessing. So glad my brother brought some fried chicken over here today. I'm like, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. I get to have some meat because of this promise right here. This provision right here. Hallelujah. And then the next P is what we call prohibition. Remember in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, God gives one prohibition. And it has something to do with eating. He says, of the tree, of all the trees of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you will surely what? Yeah. Same principle here. He gives a prohibition of what not to eat. Right? Look at verse 4. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not what? You shall not eat. This is amazing. He's he's with this covenant here. He's still laying it down like you can't don't do this. Not only because I'm God and holy, but because it's not good for you. But it's more than that. It's because there's something symbolic in the blood. Life. Remember, this is about the preservation of life. Life is in the blood, right? Life is in the blood. All right. I can sense here that we need to close it down. So I'm going to pick back up where I left off. I'm not going to give you the last P. Or was the last two, two P's? The last two? Y'all got to come back next week for the last two P's. All right? We're going to end right there. I have a lot to say about this prohibition right here and about this idea of life. I don't want to get into it. I want to, I want to try to be as diligent as I can with the time. I know people have to work tomorrow, as I do too. Um, thank you for uh, coming out. <clears throat> And that ends our study. We want to make sure that we pray so that way those who have to, those who have to leave, those who